Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Igor Kabilev, and I'm uh, Vice President of Engineering at DataArt. And I want to introduce our next uh, speaker and uh, presentation. Um, um, today, we're continuously submerged into technology media buzz about the latest and greatest uh, things that will supposedly change the world. Um, too many times we have seen technologies failing, uh, trying to make their way to the market in despite of all the high hopes. Sometimes it happens because technology does not live up to the hype. Um, sometimes because technology does not solve the real problem. Um, in data art, we believe that the key um, to the success of any promising technology is the right team. A uh, perfect mixture of business and technology thinking. Uh, mutual efforts to understand each other. With this next presentation, we want to start a series of informational talks about technologies um, that have a potential to disrupt healthcare as well as other industries. Artificial intelligence is one of these technologies. Unfortunately, as it often happens with uh, pretty much uh, all hot topics, AI is currently overhyped and stretched by the media up to the point that almost any piece of software is called AI. We want experts to tell you the truth about AI without the hype. And our next speaker holds advanced degree in mathematical physics, PhD in condensed matter physics, and is a lead mathematician and data scientist at DataArt. Please join me in welcoming Anton Delgich. Contemporary healthcare suffers contemporary, a number of contemporary illnesses. Among them, uh, Medical years done by human doctors uh, raise an amount uh, of data that, uh, that is difficult to tackle for human doctors. And uh, highly subtle processes uh, that are difficult, uh, processes and uh, workflows that are difficult to optimize and to control for human regulators. Is there something to, that can help us to cure a healthcare? Something that can think as human and at the same time uh, to be more intelligent than human? Artificial intelligence. So the purpose of this talk is to understand how can artificial intelligence can help us to cure a healthcare and to deal with uh, all the above mentioned problems. But before we start, we, we have to understand what does it mean, the artificial intelligence. While with artificial is, uh, okay. Okay, while uh, it's uh, pretty much clear with artificial, the term intelligence needs uh, additional efforts to understand. Uh, I will follow the textbook of uh, Peter Norick, uh, who, uh, who gave a pretty clear definition of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is something, is an, is an agent then that can act or think humanely or rationally. So no, now we have to understand what does it mean to act, to think humanely or rationally. I forgot to, to press this button, I'm sorry. So, here it is. But uh, before, uh, before we'll try to, uh, to understand this, uh, I'd say that uh, artificial intelligence uh, appeared as a, uh, uh, as a effort from a very various uh, fields, of, uh, fields of science, fields of uh, humankind activities. And uh, while it's pretty much clear with uh, mathematics, uh, why philosophy? Philosophy, uh, in, uh, in, in philosophy, we try to, uh, to answer the questions uh, like uh, where the knowledge does come from, or uh, how mind does appear from brain. That is what uh, philosophy is about. So to build an, uh, a good artificial intelligence, we have to be good in robotics to manipulate objects. We have to be good in uh, machine learning to learn new patterns uh, and uh, to, uh, 
um, build uh, uh, behavior, uh, uh, adequate behavior. We have to be good in natural language process and to communicate with um, uh, with human and to understand uh, them. Uh, we have to be good in automated reasoning to use uh, the knowledge we have to answer questions. We have to be good in knowledge representation just to store the information we have or we got. And finally, we have to be good in computer vision just to perceive objects. It's So uh, let me discuss briefly uh, uh, these terms, this uh, humanely rationally. What does it mean? Think and act. So to think humanely means to possess uh, uh, thinking abilities the human possess. It's uh, learning, uh, solving problems, and making decisions. This was what does it mean to, to think humanely. Uh, to think rationally means uh, it's easy to perceive, to reason, and to act. And think, uh, act, act rationally. Act rationally is also pretty simple. It, to, it means to act, uh, to, to act according, uh, given an information, given the knowledge, and to achieve uh, uh, one's, uh, one's belief. So what about uh, acting humanely? It's uh, a little bit more difficult because we, we have to, uh, to formulate what does it mean, uh, what does it mean intelligence? And uh, uh, because we know that we are building artificial intelligence and what does it mean intelligence? So we, we believe that humans are intelligent. Uh, humans are intelligent. So what does it mean? Uh, there are a lot of uh, definitions uh, of intelligence based on possessing uh, such uh, characteristics as uh, self-awareness or uh, what else? Uh, ability to, to reason and to make decisions. But we need something uh, that is uh, for, uh, the definition from the point of view of computer that, uh, that will be possible to to express as a computer program. Uh, this definition was given by Turing in 1950, and uh, uh, now it is called uh, a Turing test. Turing test means uh, uh, for human interrogator, after posing some questions and getting answers, uh, not to be able to tell the difference whether these uh, answers came from a computer or from a human. So to Act humanely for computer program means to is the same as to pass the Turing test. There is also what is called the complete Turing test. Uh, complete Turing test uh, also uh, uh, includes uh, uh, visual, uh, a visual test. So uh, we have not been able to to tell the difference between this, I don't know how to call this robot and uh, and the human. So our, uh, our view of uh, artificial intelligence uh, have developed uh, gradually. And uh, we, we all know this uh, quite a famous movies like Blade Runner, Terminator, and the recent Ghost in the Shell. It's uh, all the uh, uh, examples of the uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, definitely uh, those examples would pass the complete Turing test easily. So it's, uh, it's clear. But uh, what about the contemporary artificial intelligence? Is it uh, the same pretty, the same uh, oh, looking like a human, like the, for example, Terminator? Definitely not. Definitely, unfortunately not. So le let me tell about some contemporary models of artificial intelligence that are are most popular and that are most suitable for, for the use in a healthcare practice. First of all, so it's a neural network. So uh, the idea of neural networks uh, came from the, from the nature as, uh, as usual. And here we can see the uh, picture of two connected neurons. Uh, 
what is important uh, for, uh, for us is that neurons can communicate uh, each other uh, by means of the electrical signals uh, and they can communicate or they can uh, uh, respond to, uh, to this uh, signal. And here is a, a quite simple mathematical definition uh, of the uh, new, of a single neuron. We will not discuss it. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's not necessary. But uh, what is important is that it is possible to mathematically describe the neuron. It is possible to build a, a clear mathematical model of the neuron and to use it to solve it. Absolutely. And when we have uh, connected uh, new neurons in brain, we, we can uh, use uh, uh, modern uh, uh, techniques like uh, neuroimaging and can build, uh, uh, and can visualize. Uh, and uh, uh, what you can see here is, uh, is called a connectome. It's an uh, image of the connected neurons in brain. There are a number of techniques of neuroimaging like PET or functional MRI to, to use it, uh, to, to construct it. So what is uh, especially useful about neural network is that uh, they can be effectively used uh, in such a task like uh, image uh, recognition and uh, patterns learning. So uh, the very uh, the outstanding example, uh, recent example of the neural networks is uh, what is called uh, it's, uh, the native uh, adversarial networks. It's uh, uh, actually it's, uh, it's not a one single network. It, uh, there are two competing networks. One is called uh, generating and uh, generative and uh, another network uh, is a discriminator. What is so beautiful about this model? Uh, this model can, uh, first of all, is an attempt to, to obtain what is called uh, unsupervised learning. So it means learning without a teacher. So we can give a, a set of images uh, to this neural network, and this neural network can teach it uh, by itself. And uh, after that, uh, it will be able to produce or generate the same images. So how it looks like. We initially we have a uh, database of images. Uh, we get it to the generative uh, uh, generative network, uh, and uh, this generative network starts to to learn how to generate these pictures. Uh, uh, when we say learn uh, uh, in neural networks, it means to to get to ob to try to obtain features that are that uh, fully is is. Uh, uh, as much exactly describe the object we are interested in as possible. So we call it fu futures. So the generative model take a futures from the images and uh, put uh, what, uh, what it uh, produces to the discriminator model. Discriminator model uh, in turn try to, to say is it true image or not and uh, this process can be, um, can be continued uh, for, for a number of times, and uh, finally we'll get the uh, learned uh, models, the learned neural networks that can, one can generate uh, realistic images, another can say is it realistic enough or not. And uh, finally we will get something like the generative model produces images, discriminator model say, says these images are true, the, the, that, was, uh, that are images that we uh, initially had. So it's, uh, it's an interesting example of uh, using the neural networks, but it's not clear how it can be applied to healthcare. Uh, I think it's, I'll say an example is this uh, startup in silica medicine. Uh, uh, these guys uh, uh, used uh, the generative, uh, the adversarial neural networks to predict a new compound that can be used as drugs. So they uh, take uh, the, the, they took the PubChem uh, database that contains 72 millions of uh, chemical compounds and uh, torch these uh, neural networks 
and finally they found there is no they finally found new 69 compounds that were not tested. So it's potentially, uh, these compounds are potential drugs. Actually it's not drug, it, 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 it leads, but nevertheless. So I think it's, um, I'll send an example of the, of the neural networks. So uh, the next uh, popular model is a Bayesian networks. Why it's so important? So it can be, it, it's popular in uh, a decision uh, uh, making systems uh, or on uh, expert systems that are used to, to make a di diagnosis, me medical diagnosis. So here you can see the uh, very simple example of this Bayesian network. It, uh, it is represented as a uh, graph. It's a directed graph where arrows stay, uh, states for causal relationships between nodes and each node is some observation. This uh, alarm network was used uh, to, um, uh, to monitor uh, a, a patient's after the operations and used by an anesthesiologist. It's, uh, it's quite popular as a, test, uh, as a test model. So again, a relationship uh, between nodes are causal relationships. And of course, there are a number of uh, uh, another methods that are quite popular in not in artificial intelligence, but it's uh, mostly about the machine learning, it's a clustering, classification, regression, uh, and I think it's uh, uh, they were used in uh, uh, in the example that we already uh, heard today. So, what is AI today? What are examples of AI? So we we understand that we don't have a terminators right now, right now but do, it, uh, do, do we need them for health care? So uh, I'll, briefly, uh, I'll briefly discuss some um, uh, pretty interesting examples. One is uh, quite recent research, very recent I'll say. It's a prediction of Alzheimer's disease from uh, PAT images. So you can take uh, uh, scans, these scans. You can, uh, can learn the uh, neural network. And finally, you'll build uh, the model that can distinguish between normal patients, the patients with uh, mild uh, impairments, and the patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it's possible to optimize the process of uh, of this uh, image processing. It's very important. Uh, another prominent example that is not about the healthcare. Uh, uh, this, this example is about the, uh, the gaming. It's a Go game. Uh, I think you've heard about this. Uh, last year, uh, Google uh, uh, managed to to overtake uh, the champion, world champion in Go. And uh, here is uh, how much CPUs, GPUs, and special units that are appropriate for machine learning were, were used. And uh, why it's so important? Why it's more important than uh, overtake the world champion of, of chess, for example? The answer is, uh, the answer is that because the Go is much more difficult. The Go game is much more difficult. There are almost uh, unmeasurable number of combinations you can, uh, you can play the Go game. So while in chess we have only 400 next move after the first move, in Go it's uh, more than uh, 100,000 of moves. So we cannot take, uh, uh, we cannot play Go just by brute force and by uh, straightforwardly uh, looking for uh, uh, solutions. We have to use something more sophisticated, and uh, this is uh, what was called the Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, uh, it means that uh, before each step, we choose, uh, we randomly choose the variant, and uh, we play this variant till the end. So it's a very powerful technique. That is why 
gore this uh, the championship was uh, so important uh, another uh, another example that is that uh, looks uh, more like the terminator so androids is uh, the startup uh, the startup who uh, uh, the startup uh, produces a robot that can uh, interact with you visually. They can look into your eyes and they have the screen, an uh, interactive screen that uh, you, can, you can ask equations, you can, it, it can uh, remember you to take a pill, so, and so on. So this uh, startup, I think, is also touches a very, uh, very difficult, uh, uh, let's say, very difficult problem because uh, it was believed so far that only human can care human, but here the guys proposed to, for robot to care humans. So, how we can ask? We can ask how playing Go game can be more useful than a Terminator or and all this girl from the Ghost of the Shell. How it can be useful for healthcare, especially. And uh, the rest of the talk, I will uh, I will give you some some simple and uh, uh, at the same time uh, spectacular examples of the applying AI in the healthcare practice. So healthcare is not uh, only about the healing people, but it's uh, uh, it's also about uh, to facilitate the process of the healing and to to make it uh, also to make it less less expensive. So we'll consider four areas. First of all is uh, microbial modification, so microbes. Also we uh, will see some examples from the uh, disease uh, cure or prediction or understanding disease. Are examples for about the uh, discovering new drugs and examples about the population care. So what about microbes? This is uh, an interesting quote from the Raster. And example is this uh, recent startup, uh, Zamergen. Uh, what they propose is to take, uh, not actually creating artificial microbes, but to modify, to modify microbes to make them better. Better means to, uh, to make it more useful for us, for example, to to be able to faster, uh, uh, to be able to faster fermentate, I don't know, some milk and uh, in agriculture, some agricultural usages. So what is very difficult is uh, the number of ways you can modify genes. It's a huge number. For example, the number of uh, approximate number of stars in the universe in 10 to the power of 24. So. Again, it's not possible to, to tackle this uh, problem straightforwardly. And uh, it will, yeah, it will, it will have an impact in a very, in a number of industries. Food industry, because of uh, fermentation, they, they also claim that can uh, uh, make microbes to produce new materials. For example, it can be uh, kind of brazen cloth. And uh, agriculture also, again, is, Example. So what, what they do, they put microbes as input, use uh, some unknown algorithm, because I didn't find any information about this. They use machine learning and process optimization and uh, changing uh, changes genes in, uh, might be using this, this new neural network that can optimize these processes. And finally, what we get is, uh, uh, it's a lot of benefits for, for those industries, like high yields, faster fermentation, and new materials. Yeah, we can repeat this process till, uh, till we get the, the, what we want to, to get. So while uh, it, it is possible to make some of the microbes better, uh, the rest of the microbes still are mortal enemies. So we need a better drugs, we need a better drugs, it's our uh, weapon against the microbes, and we need a new drugs, and we need a new drugs faster. Because it's well known that it's, uh, it's a, it takes a, a, a very long time to, to
to deliver new drug to the market. So AI can uh, can do a lot uh, in this regard. So first of all, it can uh, facilitate the process of the dr new drug delivery. It can uh, help to find new targets, new targets uh, to to give the drugs. It can uh, help to find safe candidates. Mean safe candidates mean uh, means candidates with uh, less uh, as less as possible adverse effects. So we can predict the adverse effects of new of potential drugs. Uh, of course, it's uh, novel drugs and. Uh, finally, it can uh, help us to better understand the disease, to, to get a deeper understanding that disease uh, is not just a set of uh, phenoty phenotypes. So a very uh, a spectacular example of this is uh, what is called targeted protein degradation. So protein degradation is a natural uh, fabric for a re recycling fabric. Uh, it's used by uh, by a healthy cell to to degrade it to degrade uh, uh, proteins, some proteins. So it also can be used uh, for a, as a precise drugs uh, as a precise uh, drug for cancer. So here we see. Uh, the results of uh, molecular dynamics modeling uh, of the process of the protein uh, degradation. So the protein degradation process is uh, usually um, go through uh, according to what is called uh, ubiquitin, ubiquitin uh, proteasome pa uh, pathway. So for the first step, uh, the molecule of the protein is uh, 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 ubiquitinized. It means uh, the ubiquitin is attached to the uh, protein. After this, this uh, complex can be uh, can be uh, say so proteasome after that starts to, to see this complex and can attach it to, to itself. Uh, after that uh, uh, after that proteasome just uh, uh, turns this protein into a number of polypeptides that uh, finally can be used in intracellular processes. So f the problem is to find a target site of protein that can be ubiquitinized. It's uh, no, not that easy. It's again cannot be solved uh, straightforwardly. We have to to understand what sites are an, uh, appropriate for ubiquitinization. And uh, we, we cannot just take a molecule of ubiquitin and put it on, on the protein. We need uh, to, to construct some new chemical that can transfer ubiquitin uh, and attach it to the, exactly to the, that protein that we want to, to be degraded. So in, uh, in the recent research, uh, the guys uh, used a very uh, Quite, quite sophisticated method. They used uh, uh, and uh, databases uh, available for the already ubiquitinated proteins. They found uh, ubiquitinated size. They found non-ubiquitinated size, and they built a random forces a popular model on the model. Uh, in a machine learning, uh, and uh, they built a predictor using this uh, ubiquitinated fragments and their characteristics, non-ubiquitinated fragments and their characteristics, and uh, the accuracy of the model was uh, uh, was a pretty big, a seventy-two percent. It's it's fine. So we we we're not just guessing how to or, or where to. To, to attach the molecule, we can now uh, uh, you, uh, we can now do this for process specifically for for the site we need. So, and uh, what is also interesting that uh, this uh, this technique can be used not only to activate proteasome, but also to to deactivate it. And uh, this process can be useful to treat uh, such an illnesses like uremia uh, when we. Uh, 
when we lose uh, proteins or especially muscle proteins be because they uh, these muscle proteins are uh, degraded by the proteasome so we need to uh, decrease its uh, activity uh, in another area where uh, artificial intelligence is is and could be uh, well used is uh, uh, making diagnosis Making di diagnosis is a very, very difficult problem, and these two contradicted qu uh, quotes, I think, uh, emphasize it. So, first quote is, uh, is in, uh, I think, it's an example of the Occam's razor, while another, another states that uh, uh, instead of uh, having just one single disease, uh, people. Oh, one of a patient can have uh, as many diseases as uh, uh, he wants. So there is, a, there is a contradiction, and that is why it's uh, that is one reason why it's so difficult to make a diagnosis. So uh, here you can see the uh, results of the recent studies about the accuracy of the human physician. Okay, uh, on the physicians uh, and. Uh, I'll say what's uh, on this graphic. The, the first one is for uh, easy problems, so okay, easier compared to, to the next one. Uh, these uh, uh, field circles mean confidence, and the open circles means uh, uh, states for accuracy. So w when confidence is high, the accuracy is uh, also pretty high, and uh, uh, that is true for easy problem. The same is true for uh, more difficult problems, but the accuracy is much more lower. Accuracy of physicians is much more lower. Nevertheless, it is believed that uh, it is believed from, and this belief is uh, came from uh, came from the experience that uh, the physicians' uh, accuracy are about 80, 85 percent. Uh, there was a study uh, that uh, compared the accuracy of the human physicians and uh, the, uh, what is called symptom checkers. Symptom checkers is not a uh, kind of this, uh, let's say, uh, computer program that uh, used in clinics. It's, uh, uh, I, uh, it's, a, it's a, I guess it's a simple program that you can uh, install to, to your smartphone and use as a, uh, as a hell, when you okay, if you feel feel bad, you can ask it. Uh, uh, I have a headache. I cough in. Uh, I have a fever. What happened? And a symptom checker should uh, give you uh, a correct answer. It, uh, it should make a diagnosis. So it appears that uh, these symptoms checkers, nevertheless have a much lower diagnostic accuracy as a human physician. In both cases, when uh, uh, in what about given just a single diagnosis and when physicians uh, propose uh, top, uh, the most, uh, most probable three diagnoses. In all cases, uh, physicians uh, overtake the symptom checkers. But does it mean that uh, artificial intelligence cannot be applied, cannot be accurate enough to, to, to be used for making diagnosis? It's not true because uh, uh, the methods of machine learning are much more powerful in, in patterns recognition. And, uh, in patterns recognition, and uh, it means uh, it can find patterns in audio or any signals, for example, audio signals or images like uh, uh, PET scans we, we've already seen. I will miss the slide. So uh, a, very, uh, a very prominent example is uh, making diagnosis uh, of our Alzheimer's disease. It's, uh, the problem with Alzheimer's is that uh, it cannot be cured, but uh, if diagnosed uh, at early stages, it, uh, uh, the development of the disease can be, can be pretty much slowed. So the idea is to use 
the audio signal, the voice, and uh, to, to build a model that can, using some uh, features of the signal, uh, make uh, or distinguish between healthy patients and uh, the one who has a severe Alzheimer's disease or mid uh, uh, impairments. So in, in this article, uh, the authors used uh, 50, I, I think 50, uh, 50 features. Uh, uh, they used uh, naturally spoken language and uh, features like uh, semantic fluency or aphasia, or uh, they also used, what else, uh, confronting naming. And they also use uh, uh, spectrum features like ML frequency, and uh, the obtained model, the obtained model, has a, again a very high uh, level of accuracy, more than eighty percent. So we we can see that artificial intelligence uh, can really help us to uh, in, in in this way. So another another example of this uh, patterns recognition is uh, dealing with uh, images, and uh, this is about the cancer diagnostics. The problem with uh, cancer diagnostic uh, uh, that is done based on a computer scan is that uh, first of all it's uh, quite difficult to to analyze the scans for human, and uh, another problem is that the amount of the scans uh, grow grows and it grows dramatically, it's tripled for, for this uh, last, uh, 14 years. And uh, for radiologists, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge burden to, to, analyze, this, uh, to an analyze these images. And uh, this, will, uh, this results in a, a growing numbers of medical errors. And the medical ears is the third reason of disease in the U.S. It's uh, more than uh, the cancer and heart disease will only, only have the uh, 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 two small lives. So image processing. Uh, the widely used model is uh, neural networks and especially what is called convolutional neural networks. Uh, there is a data set uh, that is labeled. Labeled means that uh, we know where, uh, which images uh, contains cancer cell and, and which are not. Okay, here we see the one of the uh, examples of this picture is uh, it's a computer scan or computer tomography scan. It's a giga, it has uh, more than 10 gigapixels here. And it's almost impossible to, uh, for, he, uh, for human doctor to, to see any differences between pixels here. But nevertheless, uh, there is a lot of information inside because uh, the density of the pixel is huge. So using the neural networks, we can find, uh, we can find uh, uh, this uh, cancer cells uh, easily. And uh, the model accuracy is uh, huge, it's uh, 89%. The, the result, uh, this results were published uh, now in ArcSafe, and these results uh, are done in Google's uh, laboratory. Another way uh, the artificial intelligence can be useful for us uh, for healthcare, I mean, it's uh, understanding disease. So disease so far uh, uh, was considered as a number of phenotypic characteristics. So we used uh, physiological uh, features to, to say whether we have disease or not. But uh, in 2000, it, uh, uh, there were a bloom of, uh, of various omics, I mean, Metabolomics, proteomics, uh, lipidomics. So it means uh, that uh, it, it became possible to measure 
uh, to measure exactly what happens inside the cells. We can measure concentrations in real, changes concentrations in, in real time of the proteins, lipids, and uh, uh, products of uh, metabolism. So all this omics, I mean, proteomics, lipidomics, and metabolomics uh, constitute uh, what is called human interactome. Human interactome is a huge, uh, huge uh, graph with uh, up to 100,000 of nodes. It's, okay, it's uh, very easy, uh, very difficult to uh, analyze. And with, uh, uh, with a neural network, we can build a, uh, we can build a, a network uh, uh, which can, uh, uh, this uh, network uh, consists of uh, meta human interactome and uh, also that can uh, feel the changes of the external factors and the disease now is is considered as an emergent phenomena of, of this network so disease is not a phenotypic characteristic it's an emergent phenomenon so the same emergent phenomena is mind mind is emergent phenomena of brain so uh, another Another examples where I have uh, a few time. Uh, another examples uh, where the uh, AI can help us is wearables. Wearables are useful because they can produce uh, a lot of uh, a lot of good data. Good data means uh, tidy data with no missing information and uh, with a continuous time series of uh, a lot of uh, vital signs. It's a huge growing market. And it solves, uh, wearable solve uh, uh, and one of the major healthcare problems that is uh, the medical data are messy. Medical data is messy and 80% uh, of it is unstructured. So what to do with this data? It's a vital science that can be measured. So what to do with data? We can see here, so three main tasks of wearables is uh, uh, predicting, uh, predicting anomalies. Uh, uh, or um, uh, anomalous observation and prediction of the of some uh, unusual patterns and uh, making diagnosis. This all three can be achieved. And here is an example of a successful startup, a life core. They they've created uh, uh, the device to electrodes, then uh, by pressing it and uh, taking for the five minutes. We can uh, measure the cardiogram and, for example, say it uh, to, to physician. And here is just an example of neural networks uh, under the hood of, of the device. Population care I will miss because we, we've heard a lot of them about today. It's the uh, main, uh, main directions where artificial intelligence can uh, facilitate this uh, to, uh, to succeed in this area. Uh, finally, what what lies ahead? What lies ahead? It's uh, now it is. People are worried about the the artificial intelligence. They are worried that they can lose jobs. So that uh, artificial intelligence will overtake uh, human physicians. What I can say is just uh, I can give you just a few uh, two two quotes. One of these uh, uh, from Roman. So the idea is that uh, artificial intelligence is not to overtake uh, uh, human doctors, but to extend their abilities, extend our abilities to to making diagnosis, to analyzing uh, images, and predicting disease. And uh, another one is a, a very interesting book, and uh, uh, the author states that. Uh, there, are, there is no uh, artificial intelligence uh, so powerful that it, uh, it can overtake the, uh, the f f physicians. So we don't need to worry. And uh, finally, just let me play just a very simple game. Uh, there was, you see, there was a research, uh, and in this research, uh, there was proposed a model a model that can predict the probability of, uh, of the job to be overtaken by the artificial intelligence. 
And uh, uh, according to this, uh, according to this model, for example, the probability for medical and physical and clinical laboratory technicians to uh, to be replaced by the artificial intelligence is high. It's uh, forty-seven percent. For epidemiologists, it's uh, twenty percent lower. What about pharmacists? How do you think? Is it high? Pharmacist is uh, the guy who can uh, give an advice of uh, using uh, medicals and uh, predicting, for example, adverse effects and predict dose. It's uh, just one person, just one person. And what about the physicians? It's very low, just 0 0.4. Probability is very high, so I think it's, it, it can be understood that we, we shouldn't worry about this. So throughout, uh, you, may, you may have noted that throughout the presentation I've used uh, the quotes from famous sci-fi authors. The things they wrote about now are part of our lives. Fantastic dreams of yesterday now turned uh, into things we take for granted. And that is exactly what data art does. So if you upgrading your uh, healthcare and uh, interested in artificial intelligence uh, works, uh, work for your solution, Please come talk to me and uh, or one of my colleagues and remember that transformation of healthcare starts with you. Those numbers you just put up there, is that are those results because of the end user adoption will not accept an AI doing that job or it's physically impossible for AI to do that job? Uh, uh, I, uh, I think that that uh, contemporary artificial intelligence is not precise enough in, in some of the areas. For example, in uh, making diagnosis given a kind of symptoms, uh, phenotypic symptoms, I mean fever, temperature, and all that. So the accuracy is pretty low. Uh, nevertheless, uh, artificial intelligence uh, demonstrates a very high accuracy in what about uh, image learning, or okay, there's all this uh, pattern of recognition. So here it, it can, not to overtake, but it can substantially uh, extend our, our abilities. It can help us to, not to do physicians, okay, physicians not to do this, uh, this ears. So. Yeah, so it's basically the limitation of the technology at this point, but in time, um, we expect it to expand to the point where you won't be able to tell the difference whether you're talking to a computer or a human. Uh, my name is Eric Essentoft. Um, I was participating in RSNA in Chicago last year, and uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning was a very hot topic. And there was uh, a researcher from one of the biggest hospitals and the Research Institute in the United States that predict that uh, detecting of uh, breast cancer will could be done automatically in within four years. And the other, certainly much more complex as lung cancer, it lay, lay about 10 years in the front. So you're asking whether or not we can predict it within four years and then in 10, is that the question? Uh, okay, okay, yeah, I agree. Any My question is, how are you defining accuracy? Uh, but uh, it, it depends uh, on the case. So, for example, uh, what about the uh, accuracy of the model in, uh, in Alzheimer's disease diagnostic? It's uh, the probability of uh, 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 distinguishing between uh, healthy patients and uh, healthy patients and uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease. In uh, machine learning accuracy, it, it depends where we, we can, uh, uh, we, we have the specificity and uh, accuracy is uh, well known, this uh, 
uh, div how I say this a ratio of two positive and two negative on uh, all that. So in in in, in this example that uh, I've shown accuracy is just a probability of how accurate uh, okay the number of uh, the number of healthy uh, uh, patients that uh, that al al algorithm can detect among the healthy patients so a number of uh, the percent of years in detecting the patients for example with Alzheimer's disease just a frequency I think it's just a frequency. are you referring to the last bit the 1.2 percent Which one? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, accuracy and confidence, yes? Yes, that one. Accuracy and confidence. Uh, I, I think here it's uh, mostly about the number of uh, of uh, correct diagnosis against uh, the overall diagnosis. Yeah, so this is actual real world data and it's, it, uh, the accuracy is because it was accurate. So that's all this measurement is, whether or not they actually had the right diagnosis. Any other questions? Yeah. This will be the last one and then we're gonna wrap it up, go on break. Hi, my name's Alan Waxman. Uh, my question is, is perhaps you can speak to the difference between artificial intelligence and just intelligence, and I think uh, you brought up a series of examples that have to do with biological systems. Um, one was the microbe, and uh, is that actually, you know, refining that microbe or even working with genes, is that then an artificial intelligence, or is the process working with actually uh, an intelligence the same way we could then say for a physician or, or a somebody who would give a diagnosis is then and intelligence, which is then enhanced by collaborating with an artificial intelligence. And I also am wondering, you know, in terms of a, a biological system, is there going to be a shift from a kind of causal way of looking at things in terms of artificial intelligence to more of a kind of open, uh, not necessarily direct cause and effect oriented ecological approach in terms of some kind of intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. Uh, well, what about these uh, examples with uh, microbes? Uh, I, uh, I think we can, uh, uh, the artificial intelligence here is, uh, yeah, it, it looks uh, more like the machine learning, but uh, the, whole, the whole solution is more like artificial intelligence. I mean that uh, there is, a, the, the system uh, takes uh, decisions by itself how to modify these microbes. So these futures are not, uh, are not uh, produced or proposed, developed by human engineers, by, but uh, by this machine learning algorithm. And the whole, the whole solution is, can be called the artificial intelligence in this case. But uh, what about the, the shift uh, uh, in, in our, our understanding is uh, quite difficult for me to uh, to think about this uh, objectively because uh, I, I'm, I'm the guy with a mathematical background and uh, for me the causality is uh, the way, uh, the, the, uh, I think it's the right way to, to build the artificial intelligence because it can be, it can be mathematically formulated, we can, uh, uh, we know the theory of the decision theory, we know how to to make decisions in uh, under uncertainty, I mean, when we have a missing data. So this uh, Bayesian learning approach uh, for me is, uh, uh, for me is, uh, seems to be uh, mm, quite good for, for building artificial intelligence. Yeah, so That's what I want to say. For the, for the microbes, you could say that uh, if you don't believe in intelligent design, well, we've now done intelligent design on our own using artificial intelligence. Now it's, it's, we have to wait to see whether or not our designs are any better, better than nature or they cause us to, you know, one day go extinct because of it. We'll see. Anyway, let's go on break. Thank you.